Amen. And so this morning uh, is Youth Sunday, right? So we're going to have our high school interns. Uh, we got about nine of them. They're going to be sharing out of the book of James. And so they each kind of took a section of that, and they're going to share a little three to five minute, uh, sh- many, 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 many sermons on those. And so they're going to just go. And some of them couldn't be here today, so we'll have some videos uh, for some of those, and so, and then we'll have some that are also in person. And so, I would encourage you, man. I took a ton of notes. I had like two pages of notes from from first service. So I would just encourage you, lean in, because uh, because the book of James, man, it's a it's a deep well of of information, and it's convicting, and it just pulls things out of us. And so, as these kids are are sharing from the book of James, just lean in and and listen, have an have an ear to listen to what the Lord wants to say to you, because He has plenty to say to you this morning. Through these kids. And so um, our first uh, uh, share, it's Noelle, and she is not here, so she's going to be sharing from a video, and she's just going introdu- to give us an introduction into the book of James, and then uh, we'll go from there. We'll have Lowell come up next, and uh, we'll go on from there. And they, they got it down. First service was wonderful. So uh, just pay attention and have fun. Let's have fun this morning, all right? Amen? Amen. All right. Kick it off, Noelle. Good morning, Life Church. Thanks for joining us today. I get the to introduce our book of James we're going to go through today um, with our lovely interns we have. Um, I'm Noelle Young, and um, I just want to start by telling you a few things about the author who wrote James. It's always important to do the background on whenever you're going to read a book. So um, who wrote the book? James, the Jesus... Um, that's Jesus' brother. He wrote the book. He wrote it when he was around 50 years old um, in 46 to 61 AD is the estimate time of when it was written. Um, something about James that's cool is he served on the Jerusalem Council in 50 AD, which um, gave him a very powerful role inside of the church, and he had very... Um, he had a lot of influence um, over the Christian, early Christian church. But something about James was he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after he died and came back, which I think is really interesting because having that dynamic of you're growing up in this household with Jesus, it's like you're going to be the Messiah. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> like, I don't know if I would have believed that either, but Eventually, he came around to it, um, and he became an apostle. Um, The difference between an apostle and a disciple is that an apostle is a messenger, and the disciple is someone who learns or is a student under someone else. And so James was an apostle of Christ, which meant he just went and shared around Jerusalem and all over in that area. Um, And... He wrote this book as a blueprint to Christianity, to our faith and what we should believe in and why we should and what we should do. Um, And everything really just came back to um, James's emphasis to the duty rather than the doctrine of our faith, which is like believing versus our faith. And it's really important to know the difference between believing and actually having faith because belief is when, yeah, you can believe in something, but whether you act on it is what the faith is. And so in verse, um, in chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You believe that there is a God, good. Even demons believe that and shudder. So, yeah, you can believe in God, but whether you have the faith to actually do what he calls you to do and do the faith in the works of it is what he wants for us. So, next I would like to introduce Lowell, and he will give us chapter one to start. Thank you, Noel. Hey, what's going on, guys? Um, I will be sharing James chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 18. Uh, my name is Lowell, of course. Uh, and 
today, I want to talk about something uh, we all experience, challenges and trials. Life is full of ups and downs, and sometimes it feels like the world is on our shoulders. But what if I told you that these challenges could actually be a source of joy and growth? That's exactly what James tells us in his letter, and I believe it's a message we all need to hear. Uh, verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James encourages us to see our trials not as burdens, but as opportunities for growth. It's natural to feel overwhelmed when we face difficulties, whether it's financial struggle, a health issue, or a relationship problem. But James teaches us that these moments are not actually testing our faith and developing our perseverance. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but James teaches us that these moments are actually testing our faith and developing our perseverance. This perseverance isn't just about enduring hardship. It's about growing stronger and maturing. Imagine a tree standing firm in a storm. Its roots grow deeper, and its, trunks, and its trunk becomes stronger because of the adversity it faces. Similarly, our faith grows deeper, and our character becomes stronger when we endure trials with joy. Let me share a personal story. About a year ago from now, I had broken up with a person who I held dear to me. I was heartbroken, and I felt like the world was falling apart. I questioned why this was happening and struggled with feelings of loneliness and uncertainty. But through prayer and, learning on my, and leaning on my faith, I found healing and strength. That breakup, as painful as it was, helped me grow in my relationship with God and taught me to find joy and purpose in his plan for my life. He gave me opportunities to meet new people and live life through a different lens. And that in itself is one of the greatest gifts I've been given. We often don't see it in the moment, but God is working through our trials to shape us into people he wants us to be. Every challenge we face is an opportunity to grow closer to him and become more like Christ. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This verse reminds us that our struggles are not in vain. They're preparing us for the eternal rewards that God has promised. When we persevere, we not only grow in our faith, but we also secure a place in God's eternal kingdom. James also tells us in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. When we face trials, it's easy to feel lost and unsure of what to do. But God promises to give us wisdom if we ask for it. He doesn't hold back or judge us for asking. He gives generously, guiding us through our challenges and helping us find the right path. I challenge each of you to start your day with a prayer for wisdom. Ask God to guide you in your opportunities for growth. Trust that he will provide the wisdom you need to persevere to find joy in your trials. Thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce Landon. Okay, um, my name is Landon, and I am going to talk about the second half of James chapter 1, which is verses 19 through 27. Um, it's like, I encourage you to read all of it, but because of time, I'm just going to focus on the first little uh, snippet of it, and it's 19 through 21, which says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And I feel like some of that is kind of hard to do as humans, um, especially, like, when I get, like, in my life, when I get into arguments with, like, my family or friends, I always, like, try to get that last sentence off because I always want to be right. I never like to be wrong. And, like, in my house, my name is, like, Last Word Landon because it happens so much. Um, 
And, like, when I think about it, it's like, well, that's probably not what a Jesus would have done. And, like, that's our goal in life, to, li- like, live in the image of God and bring others to Christ. So, um, like, when, when we express, like, not these traits, when we're fast to anger and we don't really listen that much, people who look at you will not think kindly of Christianity because they're using you as, a, like, an a image of what Christianity is. And, like, then they're going to be like, well, what's, why would I want to do that if that's what pe- they're, they're like? Um, and that's the opposite of what our goal is as on this life on earth. Um, so we have to use these years that we have to um, bring as many people into the family of God to have eternity in heaven. And um, like in prayer, I feel like it's easy for me to like just like say whatever I want to say and then just like move on with my day if I pray in the morning. And like that, I feel like that's not how it should be. I think prayer should be uh, like more like a conversation. So whenever you pray, like in the morning, like when you wake up or at night before you go to bed or whenever during the day, I would set apart maybe a little extra time to really spend time with God and focus in on the heavenly like wisdom that he's trying to tell you because he has something to tell you. You just have to be patient enough to like listen and and like be like willing to hear Um, because when we do that, we can have a good image and people will like, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe I should check out church. Um, and do stuff like that. Um, I think our, all of our actions should model Jesus. So, like, um, like if you have a friend, I feel like you shouldn't have to tell them that you're a Christian. They should be able to figure out by how you act. And, like, one of my fears is, like, if I'm, like, if I have a good friend and I have to tell them I'm a Christian and they say, oh, I would have never known, like, I feel like that would, that would kind of suck because, like, oh, I'm doing this wrong. And you would kind of have to rethink everything, so... Yeah, that's what I have to say. I'd like to welcome up uh, Tochi, who is online. So, uh, thanks, Landon. Uh, so my section of James was James two one to thirteen, and it's mainly about how to judge, or how we're not supposed to judge other people, and also how we're supposed to show mercy to other people. Um. So judging people on things that, frankly, don't matter when you're in heaven, uh, God doesn't see the outside of us. He sees the inside. And this really uh, shows when God, God says in uh, Matthew 25, 40, he says, Truly I say to you, as you did it, one of the, as you did it to one of the least of me, my brothers, you did it to me. And this is when Jesus is talking to um, some Pharisees, and he says this because they say that we treat everyone, that we would treat you with respect, but he says that anyone that you treat badly, you are treating to me, is how you treat me. Um, uh, One of the commandments is to love your neighbor, and by judging people, you cannot love them as you're supposed to love others as you would love yourself. And if you're judging them based on things like money or how they look or their past decisions, then how would you feel if someone only looked at you and saw the bad things or the things that you've made mistakes of? Um, the next part of the passage is about mercy. And it says in James 2:13, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We're not allowed to judge people because we have sinned. We're not perfect, only God is. And God can, uh, is the only one who can judge us, and he will when we finally go up to heaven. Um, it says, any of those who have not sinned throw the first stone in John 8, 7. We have all sinned, so we cannot throw the first stone. We cannot judge other people because of what they've done, because we've also done wrong. Um, in Luke six forty one, it says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? We can't only look at what others do and judge them for that and say, uh, 
act like we're better than them because God has had mercy on all of us and he allows us to live and he really just loves all of us and we cannot look at someone else and say that they're worse because we cannot judge them because we are not God. Um, the last thing I want to say is that it can be kind of difficult to look at someone and see them as an equal to yourselves no matter like what they've done. We can, uh, a lot of us can see people as better or worse than us because of what they have. And I just want to say that God sees all of us and he sees our soul, what's inside of us. And that's so much more important than money or looks or anything else that's on the outside. Next up, uh, Emmett's going to talk about faith. Good morning. Uh, my name is Emmett, um, and the part of James that I'm going to be sharing with you guys is um, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Um, I'm going to start with verse 14. Um, James wrote, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? In this, in this verse, verse, James is asking us if you've been doing the correct thing. Have you been acting as a Christian, or have you been acting of the world? We can't be living a two-sided life. You have to be, you have to act like a Christian on Sundays, but you also have to act like them at home, at work, and during the weekdays. We have to show others that we are Christians and that we act like one, so that we can show them what it really means to be a believer. There are two different types of faith that I'm going to be talking about today. There's a saving faith and a dead faith. Um, in James chapter 2, 15 through, 16, he, 15 through 17, he gives us an example of what a dead faith is. It says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way... Faith by itself, if not accompanied by an action, is dead. Your actions matter a lot. For some of you in here, your actions need to change. So that it will represent your Christian faith throughout your whole week. I struggle with a dead faith sometimes when I'm arguing with my parents or fighting with my brothers or um, saying some things that I probably shouldn't have said. Um, I want to ask you a question. Where are areas in your life where you're experiencing a dead faith? Um, somebody who had a saving faith in the Bible is Abraham. Abraham had one of the most faith-testing moments in the Bible. In Genesis 22, verses 1 through 3, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took him, two of his servants, and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he sent out for the place that God had told him. This shows how faithful Abraham really was to God. He was willing to give up his one and only son so that he could grow closer to God. Um, in chapter... And later in that chapter, verses 11 and 12, it says, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld me from your son. God shows his compassion for Abraham and rewarded him for being faithful. We have to realize that if we live out a saving faith life and bring people closer to Jesus, God will be happy and delighted to see our faith and deeds as one. When we stay faithful to God, he will stay faithful to us. Now, uh, Maddie. Hey, guys. How we doing? We good? You're about halfway there. So, hold tight. All right. My name's Maddie. I get to talk about James 3, 1 through 12 for you guys. And if you don't know, it's about taming the tongue, which is not an easy thing to do, if you didn't know. 
All right, so one of my favorite things about James, um, the book and also the author, is that he is such a um, analogy user. He loves using practical imagery, and I'm such like a vision person. Like I need to see it out to understand it, and so I love reading it because it really helps me understand the points he's trying to make by the practical imagery that he uses. In um, James 3, he uses quite a bit of it, so we're going to kind of dive deep into it today. In verse 1, he comes swinging in automatically saying that most of us should not be teachers and that um, that is because that they get judged more strictly. And I was like, hmm, I wonder why he started it like that. Because if you read James, all of the other books, he starts with like, my dear brothers and sisters, I love you so much. God loves you. And then this one, he's like, some of y'all should not be teaching. And it's like, hmm, interesting. Okay. But then in verse 2, he starts it with saying that we all stumble in many ways. And for me, I got quite a bit of confidence out of that because you kind of get down on yourself a lot when you mess up and stuff like that. But then it, I kind of remembered that if we all do it and we all go to God with it, that he will help us and that we can find peace knowing that we are lesser for messing up. But it is just another reason for us to praise God because he's so good. In verse 4 through 6, he gives us some really good um, examples of what he's trying to say in this passage. And he starts by talking about a ship, and he says, Or take a ship as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. And my encouragement for you today is to make sure that God is the pilot of your ship. Because if he's not, then you'll find yourselves in some unnecessary storms in your life. And it's really important to just know that he is the one that is guiding your life and is, has that vision for you. Because it just makes things a whole lot easier when you have the creator of your life, of the universe, controlling your life. It's just so much easier. And then in verse 6, he also talks about how the tongue is a fire. And he says, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on, on fire by hell. And I was like, Psh, dude, that's crazy. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, I should probably like read into this a little deeper because... That's scary wording. He really likes to use strong words. And it can be a little intimidating, but the more that you read into it, the more you understand what he's trying to say. And for me, what I felt like he was saying was that it's about the little things in your life that really are the important things. Because, you know, you might think that, like, a conversation or a, like, snarky remark to somebody that you make or, you know, that one person at work that you might not get along with like rolling your eyes at them or something like that. It might not be that big of a deal, but that's just the little seed of the plant that you're growing in your heart. And I think it's really interesting that when we speak in a harm way, that's straight from Satan. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that in my life. And I realize that speaking in a harmful way is just another way that Satan gets into your life. And I don't think I've quite thought about it that way before, like that you know, if I say a comment that isn't kind or something like that, that's just another place in my life that Satan is trying to get a hold of. Then we're going to jump to verse 8, and it talks about how we can't tame the tongue on our own. And it says, but no human being can tame the tongue because it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Like I said, strong wording. I was like, what is going on? Like, this is crazy. And then, again, I sat down and I read into it a little more and felt like the Lord was telling me that our speech is one of the first signs that we need a heart check. It is also the first thing that will be thrown off of track that God has for us. And I know that most of the time, I know I need a realignment of my heart with God when my thoughts are starting to be not kind or Maybe I'm just getting really down on myself. I'm getting anxious or the conversations in my life are not as healthy as they should be. And in verse 9 and 10, he talks about how we can't love God and curse his creation. If we are created in his image, then we are doing nothing but hating on him. I think of this as like a mirror. Like when you're looking into a mirror, you might not actually be talking about yourself. Like you're looking at something that isn't you 
But if you say something bad about what you see, then you're talking bad about yourself. And that's pretty much the same thing as what we are for God. He, put a, he made us in his image. So if we're talking bad about each other, we're talking bad about God. I got a lot of conviction while I was working through this message um, and preparing it for you guys. And I felt like the Lord was working in my heart, showing me that the little things in my life are what had brought me to where I am today. And Pastor Jeff has spoken on how our little yeses can lead to miraculous change. And I think that our words play a big part in that. I encourage you today that if you're living a double life, that double life leads to death. So you must put to death that double life. Because if you are constantly living one way here and another outside of these walls, it's one, it's exhausting. You guys should not be doing that. Come on. That's way too much energy. And also, it's not pleasing the Lord, and all it's doing is harming your relationships with the people that God has put in your life. The weight of our words is something I don't really think we'll ever be able to grasp fully, and we are taught at such a young age that our words are so important, from our parents telling us to use our words when we're first learning how to use our words, or when we're fighting with a sibling and they're telling us that our words hurt them. I remember as a kid being asked if my comment was helpful or harmful. And I used to think that was such a silly thing. I was like, why are you asking me that? But now I know that it's a really important question to ask because it helps your words be in the right heart placement. I also remember when I was little, my mom would always ask me if I were to put all of my friends in the same room, if I would be the same person to every person in that room. And if I was acting the same in every environment that I was in, because I was a part of church and I went to school and I was part of theater when I was little and I did had all of these different people and she made sure that it was like really important for me to stay consistent in my character when I was little and I think that's kind of what James is telling us to do here is if you were to have everyone in your life in the same room would you be able to be that person and be somebody that God is proud of in that moment too like Emmett was saying earlier, our actions matter, but so do our words, because our words are so fundamental to our human connection. That's how we connect with one another. So my question for you today is, who has the power over your tongue? Is it the helper, the healer, or is it the deceiver and the one who brings harm into your life? Now I have the honor of introducing, through the wonderful screen, Miss Peyton Wright. Thanks, Maddie. That was really good. Okay, so I'm doing James 3, 13 through 18. And the main message that I got was that glorifying God rather than ourselves brings life from death. So what James is starting with is he's kind of doing a compliment sandwich. He's saying something nice, encouraging, and then he's saying something not so nice but more critical. And then he's saying something nice again. And so if you don't know what that is, it's like also if like I was to be like, oh, your skirt is so nice, your skirt is so cute, but your shoes are a little dirty, and then your hair, it's awesome, you look great today. It's like that. And so let's just jump into the part that we don't want to hear because it's usually the most important for us to hear. Verse 14, it says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Because such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. Wow. Okay, so I thought that the word harbor was very interesting how it started off with this. It says, but if you harbor bitter envy. And I'm like, harbor is an interesting word that they cho- that James chose to use, but... It means to bear, to hold, to cling to, to need, to entertain, to maintain, to protect, to give shelter to, to give sanctuary to. So that's a lot encompassed in that one word, harbor. And so it caused me to ask these questions based on the definitions and synonyms of harbor. Like, are you entertaining your jealousy, your covet, your consuming desire for some for what someone else has? Are you justifying yourself in protecting your ambitions? Are you idolizing what you're praying for? Are we treating ourselves like a holy temple that Jesus died for? 
are we giving sanctuary to envy in our hearts and in our bodies? You see, there's a difference between selfishness and rest, and there's a difference between motivation and hard work. But our intentions based on these questions and our answers are very important. So when we're doing something, we, didn't, we need to make sure that our intentions are so obvious in our lives so that we won't lose, sight, won't lose sight of what we're doing in the first place. King Solomon did this. King Solomon was the wisest person on earth. He asked for wisdom from God, and God gave him that. But he lost his intentions along the way because he began to get envious of what someone else had or where, um, what happened in his story. In verse 14... Um, James also says, do not deny it. We cannot deny our selfish ambitions and our pride and our um, envy over what someone else has or our jealousy because then we're lying to ourselves. We have to ask ourselves these hard questions because likely nobody else will. We cannot let Satan have that power over us by letting us believe falsely because also, James says that this worldly wisdom leads to disorder, leads to evil actions, and leads to demonic actions, which demonic is like a synonym for de demonic is devilish, which is funny because we use the word Christ-like a lot, like we want to be Christ-like, but if we're not being Christ-like, then we're being devilish, and I just don't want to be that, and sin, which leads to death. So we know this is serious and we know this is severe because no life to us, um, no life can come to us from our selfish ambition and our jealousy of our sisters or our brothers because it brings them down and it brings us down. Lastly, James not only, not only calls us out, but he calls us up. Verse 18 says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. We can see this juxtaposition of life versus death because we know that selfish ambition leads to death and we know that peace leads to life because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit from God. So striving to accomplish our selfish ambitions leads to destruction, but being quick to peace will bring a harvest of life and righteousness because it's from God. We can see that throughout James um, 13, James 3, verse 13 through 18, that glorifying God rather than ourselves brings life from death. And I also have the honor of um, bringing up one of our youth group people, Elijah Ordaz. He is amazing, and he will be leading this next section. Yeah. Good morning. Yes, um, I'm Elijah Ordaz, and today I'm going to be talking about James chapter 4. And I don't know why they did this, but um, the people, the, the people, the, I guess, staff that actually work here for the church, they made it so that uh, Taylor and I, because she'll be the person after me, each have an entire chapter of James chapter 4. Um, and I think Taylor did a much better job. I'm mostly just in the first half, so, you know. Um, anyway, James talks a lot about pride, and pride is a funny thing. Maybe, you know, you have pride for your country, you know, like... Mexico's going to totally be Ecuador later today. Or maybe you have pride uh, in the June sense of pride, which is widely celebrated. And I think as Christians, we understand that, you know, this pridefulness, being of the world, are bad. But why? Um, but before we get into that, I'm going to say something. It's a famous phrase by Jesus Christ. And you guys are going to finish it because it's directly referenced in James. So ask and you shall. You guys are so great at this. Um, in James chapter 4, starting at verse 1, it says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, just a little side note, I was looking it up because I wasn't reading until I think it's verse, uh, verse 5. 
and I looked it up because I still don't really know how to interpret it, and apparently it's one of, uh, by like scholars that actually know Greek a lot better than I do, it's one of the hardest verses to actually translate in the New Testament, so I'm glad that I get to talk to you about that a little bit. Um, and by that, I mean that's the only part where I'm going to talk about it. Anyway, if you noticed, you can see a direct counter to what Jesus says. Uh, Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. James says, you ask to receive, and you still don't receive. Um, and you can just stop right there and be like, ha, the Bible contradicts itself. That, that's not good. Um, but you can also see that James, when he's saying that, he's not saying like, oh, you ask and you don't receive. He's saying you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures, which I feel like that can be applicable to a whole lot of things, and that should really be something that you think about when praying, like, hey, am I praying for this because I need it, or am I praying about it, am I praying to God about it because I want it? Um, anyway, uh, next we have, uh, James says that friendship with the world is being an enemy of God or enmity, uh, but enemy sounds better to say. Um, and this Greek word that James uses is philia, which um, will be important later. Uh, and while we're on the topic of the world, being a friend with the world, uh, remember that uh, the world was to be governed by humans. You know, Adam and Eve, God gave the world for us to be like stewards. Then when they sinned, they kind of gave up a portion of that to evil and demonic forces. Uh, this is why when, like, Satan is tempting Jesus and he says, hey, if you worship me, I'll give you the world. You know, he's not just saying that just because he's saying that because he, he can do that. Um, and if you think that this sounds weird, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and I'm also not saying that it's correct, but I am saying that when I brought this up to Bob, he said that my theology was all right. So he, he's a pastor here. Um, anyway, uh, what I interpret this as is that when James is referring to the world, he's not talking so much about the stuff that like, you know, going on like the straight and narrow path and just like, oh, I have to do schoolwork and we just stop for a second, but then we just keep going you know, it's more of the stuff that actually actively takes us away from Jesus, you know. And that's not very good. Um, but what is our world, especially nowadays? Um, there's this big idea that I would say is similar to the Greek legend of Narcissus. And in this legend, there's this dude, Narcissus, and he is obsessed with himself. Like, he's very, like, narcissistic. You see where we get that from? Um, he, he likes himself a lot. So one time, uh, he's, like, walking across wherever, uh, and he finds, like, a pool or something, a river, and he sees his reflection in it, and he's so transfixed by his reflection that he just kind of kneels down and just stares at it for a long time, for a very long time, and he does this so much that I guess, you know, a nymph that was around there, like, got mad at him, like, hey, pay attention to me, and he was like, he, he was not paying attention to her, so she pushed him in, and uh, I'd say that that's probably Narcissus's fault, because he was so... Uh, I guess entranced by himself that he did that. And you could probably say that this dude struggled with the sin of. Thank you, interns, that remember what I was trying to go for with that. It doesn't really make sense, but whatever. Uh, this very same pride that Narcissus struggled with runs rampant in our, in our world nowadays. Uh, there's different things, like from the uh, burger place. Have it your way. Uh, this product was tailored specifically to you. Um, Maybe you've heard it in a song, I want it that way. You know, my hips don't lie, especially, especially in music, all right? They're, they're getting to you. They're brainwashing you. It's, it's the devil. Um, essentially, it's all about. I'm hearing a lot of things. It's supposed to be it's all about me. Uh, so the interns, of course, also remember that. But I don't feel like I'm uh, presenting that in the best way. Anyway, the worst part about this pridefulness is that it actually separates us away from God. Uh, in Greek, the word is hamartia. I think that's how you say it. I don't know how to speak Greek. Uh, which basically is saying that we miss the mark or we fall short. So you guys have probably heard that. That's a pretty Christian thing. We fall short um, of the glory of God. And in Proverbs 16, it says, the, it says that the Lord says, pride, arrogance, and the perverse way that I hate. You know, this is fine. Like, if God doesn't like this, then I'll just stay away from it. Um, but what James is talking about in the being a friend of the world, that kind of thing, which is like the prideful, arrogant, perverse way, um, the word that he uses to describe friendship is philia. And in Greek, there's different words for uh, love. There's, there's a lot of words. So um, I guess one of them would be agape, which is how God loves us. So he just unconditionally agapes us, which means that like we can't do anything that would make him not love us anymore. 
Um, and this philia that James is talking about refers to like a deep friendship between two best friends, you know? So it's not so much just like, hey world, what's up, bro? You know, that's how you talk to the world. It's more like, hey, and you have like a secret handshake with them that you don't tell God about, you know? And it's this deep friendship uh, that, you know, if the world is not good, especially the parts of the world that are not of God and the very bad things, you can't really, you know, be with God that much. Um, Personally, I fall victim to, you know, being in the world and also especially pride a lot. Um, I'm sure if there's any teenagers in the room, thank you for wooing with me. Um, Any teenagers in the room will know that uh, mom and dad is often a source of this. They're like, hey, do this. They're like, no, you know, and that's, that's pretty prideful. Maybe you'll hear something about like, you know, a Christian brother or sister and you'll think like, okay, that's pretty bad that they did that but at least I don't do that, you know, and all these things which aren't very good. Um, But luckily for us, God, yes, thank you, baby. Luckily for us, the baby agrees. Um, God always offers a way out of bondage. And, you know, for pride, you know, just sin in general, uh, praying, uh, spending time in the word, which you can do that and pray at the same time, you know, get a little like, you know, two birds with one stone, maybe even three birds with one stone if you do that, and then you're also actively talking to God, um, building a relationship with him. And the nice thing is that, you know, these not only help with, like, walking with humility, but they also help in, like, every other aspect of Christianity. And that's about the closest thing that I got to a resolution for what I've been talking about. Uh, Please think about it a little bit. Um, And now, through the power of the World Wide Web, it's Haley with Chapter 5. Good morning, Life Church. Um, thanks, Elijah, for covering James 4. My name's Taylor, and I'm going to go into James 5 and how James concludes his letter. Um, so James references many teachings of Jesus throughout this letter, um, and I was reminded of parables by Jesus, but the most um, reoccurring thing was the Beatitudes, and I saw a lot of overlap between those, so I wanted to start by reading the Beatitudes that are in Matthew 5. Um, They say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So going into James, he begins by talking about the rich and is warning them, like, don't get too caught up in your riches or in your possessions because they were storing up their treasures on earth versus keeping their eyes on God. And so verse 3 says, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. And so I underlined the last days because... Um, we want to focus on how we're living our lives for Christ because we know he's coming back. So um, the word testify also stuck out to me. And so when looking at the the word testify, I researched it further and found like synonyms for it, like giving evidence and other translations of the Bible say witness instead. So what does your life give witness to? Is it one that's reflecting Christ living in you or is it still reflecting you being caught up in riches or in worldly possessions or your status? And so James is saying that none of these things matter in the last days. In eternity, we're going to just want to be focused on God and praising him. So live for him on earth, too, and turn your eyes upon him. So the second point I wanted to make in James 5 was patience and suffering. And so I think that's something that a lot of Christians struggle with is just that waiting time. In James 5, 7 through 8, it says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. So it might be you today who's waiting for the autumn and spring rains for just a sign from God and know that he's there. But I want to encourage you with this message today that our trials and suffering bring us a greater understanding of God's character. Verse 10 and 11 say, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. 
And so James 1 kind of connects back to this, of consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And then going back to the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then I also wanted to highlight Matthew 5, 12, which says, Rejoice and be glad, for your, your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So it's interesting to note that both Jesus and James um, talk about the prophets and how they were persecuted in the Old Testament, but how when we're persecuted today, to look back at those stories and realize how God was still moving in their lives and how they didn't know that at the time, but we're later, a we're later able to understand God's compassion and mercy for them. We're still going to see the same thing today, where we're, if we seek God, we're going to see his compassion and mercy in our lives and learn more about him. So um, I just wanted to conclude that book of James with um, it's imp just the <laughs> realization it's important to live like Jesus, to get your life in line with his word, because you want your life to be one that reflects faith, your faith and have a testimony be about Christ. James says in verse 9 that the judge is standing at the door, so we got to get ready for him because we know that Jesus is coming back. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Bob, but thank you guys for listening. <laughs> Awesome. Was that fun? Right on. Hey, can I get the worship team back up here? We're going to close in a fun song, a very youthful song. So uh, why don't you guys stand? But I just wanted to share. I first service was taking tons of notes, and I just wanted to share some of my takeaways from this morning um, just to encourage us uh, with that. And so, like, first and foremost, like, what was said uh, early on is burdens are opportunities for growth, right? And then last words, Landon, who we should have had up here last, not second, right? He, uh, he shared that, you know, one of his greatest fears is when he tells his friends that he's a Christian and they say, oh, I would have never known. I would have never guessed that. And that we uh, need to carry uh, this, this Christ-like uh, attitude with us wherever we go so that people know of our differences, uh, and then don't judge others. God sees what's inside, and that's more important than what we see outside. Uh, have you been acting like a Christian or of the world? And for some of you, thank you, Emmett, uh, your actions need to change. Oof, that's rough. Um, what areas are you experiencing a dead faith? When we stay faithful to God, he will stay faithful to us. And that your words have power, and they have so much power that, that don't, be, don't discredit the influence that your, your words have over others. And that, is God the pilot of your ship? Because if he's not, you might find yourself in unnecessary storms. And then a double life can lead to death, so put to death your double life. And it's exhausting. I love that part. I learned what a compliment sandwich was today. Thank you, uh, Peyton, for that. Uh, that was the first time. Who else? First time hearing that. Yeah, I guess just me. Okay, cool. Uh, and, then, and then other points that I, that I have as takeaways, right? Like, are you idolizing what you're praying for? I think so often there's things that we just uh, pray to the Lord about, and they kind of become our idols. And we're like, man, that's what I really want, Lord, instead of you, Lord. And focusing on, Lord, I pray on the things that I want and desire. And then we, uh, uh, Elijah shared about friendship in James 4. It's not just this casual friendship that, that James is talking about with the world, but it's this deep friendship with sin. And when he says the world, he's not talking about individuals. He's talking about the sin of the world, the ways of the world. So keep that in mind. And lastly, what does your life give witness to? And I think those are all important points for us to take away this morning as we walk out of here. And so I hope that you guys uh, wrote some stuff down for yourselves and that the Lord highlighted some things to you. Um, but let's go ahead and worship this morning. Uh, we got a fun song, so feel free to come up to the front if you want. And we'll have prayer after service. I see you, John. I see you, John. All right. Yeah, like Bob said, get on up here in the front. Come and dance with us. We had the, the youngins with us, and they were dancing around with Lana up here. So you guys got to show them up. I believe in you. You can do it. Let's do this.
Sunday and we'll see y'all next week.